Come any closer and I'll cut you! Oh. Oh, it's just you. Right, sorry, I'm, I'm a little on edge. I just found out a bunch of games aren't for sale anymore. Imagine that, you can't buy this at a store anymore. I don't know about you, but I didn't see the rivers run wet with blood to tell me that hell was on Earth. Well, I'm bunkering down. There's not a chance I'm letting anyone take these. People on the top side must be tearing themselves apart for a copy of Lego Hobbit, right? Please lie. Media preservation is a thankless job, and I'm happy that people more dedicated than me work in the field. Much has been made about the fragility of digital media, how things like movies, music, and videos can be lost forever if someone gets a hair trigger and decides to delete it without there being a dedicated backup. Flash was gutted when support ended, and due to a lack of backups for much of the media, it's been lost forever. However, it's not just digital media that can be lost. Sometimes outside factors result in the game being unpurchasable or unplayable. Now, for a lot of examples I'm going to talk about, you can obviously buy them secondhand. You can buy secondhand bread. You can find anything with a solid enough eBay search. I'm talking about games that are actively not being produced anymore on purpose. So, limited run games like the physical copies of Night Trap and Super Mario 3D All-Stars are off the table. Just like Battleborn Lawbreakers, they were born to die. The amount of these games that have litigation following them is astounding. And one of the most infamous games like this is Too Human. Too Human was a labor of love, a love labored by Silicon Knights, a name you might be familiar with for various reasons. They created the world seen in the Legacy of Cain franchise, a franchise that went really strong until a random MOBA just f***ing killed it! Then they created Eternal Darkness Sanity's Requiem, one of the most well-regarded GameCube games of all time, and helped to create Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes, a game that helped justify why Snake is in Smash to people who are really pissy about defining rules. The other thing you might know them for is that they've burned every single bridge they've ever formed. The publishers of Legacy of Kane want to take the project in a different direction, sue them over stolen story concepts, and settle it out of court. Valley who how close you are to Nintendo as a second-party developer to the point that you consider yourself more a company inside Nintendo rather than one that works alongside it? Dissolve your working relationship the second you get a sniff of a better deal! Silicon Knights were, above all other things, looking to get their game made their way. And any interference in that path was met with Venom. That was the way it was with Two Human as well. At first, the game entered development in 1996, and it was envisioned to run on four PlayStation discs. That's the same size as Final Fantasy VIII, which is a mammoth of the game already, but soon development shifted as they learned they would now be working on a GameCube version. It got so far along in development that it was even being shown in Nintendo's Blackjack and Hooker's version of E3, Space World. Except, in 2005, Silicon Knights decided to scrub their hands at the big end and shag up with the previous letter in the alphabet. Microsoft was now publishing the game and expanded even further to a full-on trilogy of games. It's usually a great sign when you announce your big expanded universe before the first part even touches ground. Hope you're all excited for the next movie in Universal's Dark Universe. <laughs> or the Ghostbusters Cinematic Universe. Or the King Arthur cinematic I thought this joke would have been shorter, honestly. With the transition to next-gen hardware proving to be a little bit of a massive ball ache for all involved when it came to creating an engine to run their games on, Silicon Knights chose to outsource that and license the Unreal 3 engine from Epic Games. Unreal is one of the most... well, Unreal engines in games, giving life to everything from Asura's Wrath to Arkham Knight to Epic's own massively successful Gears of War franchise. Remember that. Now, a principal character who had been left out up until this point would be Dennis Dyack. Dennis was in the trenches from day one with the game, and was particularly unhappy about the fact that the game wasn't received well in the E3 demos it was shown off in. It might have been in part due to the fact that the game was a $10 million budgeted Microsoft-backed experience and still looked like it belonged on the GameCube. With mounting frustration, Silicon changed the situation and shifted concentration to litigation for the misrepresentation of cooperation and the isolation of information. What I'm trying to say is that they sued Epic for having a doo-doo stinky engine. They alleged that Epic was keeping important directions on how best to utilize the engine in order to give their flagship series Gears of War a head start in the market. They were so confident that Epic was stealing food out of their mouths that they demanded that the profits of Gears of War be turned over to them for damage they'd done to Two Human. However, Epic Games couldn't come close to doing as much damage to Two Human as Silicon Knights did. Not only did the game perform poorly, their performance in court was a whole lot worse. It turns out that someone was stealing just not the people who were accused. When looking through the code of 2Human, it was found that the code was the exact same as the Unreal Engine 3, which means that Silicon Knights was unlawfully using what Epic had made. This reversed the $4.5 million lawsuit that Silicon Knights had put forward into a $9 million one turned back on them, which is ultimately the reason the company went under in 2014. As a result of the lawsuit, Two Human was now considered stolen goods, and wasn't just taken down off digital storefronts, the physical copies that remained were to be destroyed. Not stored away, every copy was to be given a firing squad's death. 
I bet that means my copy must be worth millions. Either I can sell it on eBay for a killing or cash the bounty in on its head. A quick jaunt over to eBay and... What the fuck? It's the exact same price as if you found it in a puddle behind a GameStop. Why that is, is, well, the game sucks. It's not very good, and even with its very real scarcity, what with the copies that are already out there being the only copies that are left after the purge, nobody cares that much. It's too human. Get over it. Introducing this next game is a little difficult. I mean, can you look me in the eye and say anything you're looking at makes even a lick of sense? Now, this is what happens to a sim if you leave it out in the sun. What? This is, is Limbo of the Lost, a 2008 game created by Majestic Studios, a company that has literally only released Limbo of the Lost, which at the very least is extremely embarrassing. However, before this, they went by Trilogic, a company that made Limbo of the Lost. Am I skipping or something? Well, no, it's because Limbo of the Lost started development in 1993 on the Amiga 1200 as a point-and-click adventure text game. Seeing as the Amiga was losing ground to the PC, however, the team decided to switch development efforts to that instead. Then they died. What? No joke, the team was totally dissolved until 2003 when they reformed as Majestic Studios. Although, to be fair, the term team is a little bit disingenuous, seeing as it was a team of three. That's less a team and more a, a band or a gathering. So there's a lot to take in regarding all this. You could complain about how disgusting every single character in the game is, how the voice acting seems to be done by one guy, and one who didn't really try that hard at that. Any mob you need the king Galimbo. Well, he's at his ups and he's at his downs. Or how one of the characters is named after a slur that I will not repeat in this video. It's the F1, the bad F1. But what's really important is the only part of the game that looks passable. The backgrounds look kind of nice. Might have something to do with the fact that none of these extremely British looking men had a hand in them. There's an extensive catalog of what exactly was stolen to make this game. 11 games in total were scalped to make this one. Games like Diablo, Oblivion, Vampire the Masquerade, for God's sakes, the first screen of gameplay is from Wolfenstein. Leave Hitler out of this! The stealing goes further than just the backgrounds, though, including having the Indiana Jones theme in the game. <laughs> Pinching character designs, and even the cursor is just taken from Black and White 2. N no, not that one, the one made by the head. Thank you. Oh, for God's sakes, I was just editing this video and I found out that the intro from the game is stolen straight from the movie Spawn! Spawn! Why would you steal from Todd McFarlane? You're taking food out of his mouth! How's he supposed to draw more chains now? So obviously people were asking why they thought it was okay to besmirch their good work by putting this in front of it, to which the team responded, Oi fam, yeah, we, uh, we outsourced the backgrounds, did do nothing wrong, innit? Only that contradicted a previous interview where Steven Boys, one of the three developers on the game, claimed to have made every background himself. This wasn't even Steven's first run-in with legal troubles while making a game, as his 3D remake of the game Dungeon Master came under fire after it came out that he didn't get approval from the rights holders before making it. So tangled in a lion and way over their heads, the publishers decided to throw the team a life preserver and just pull the game and issue an apology. Since then, the team has presumably changed their names and fled the country to avoid having to be associated with this. Even to this day, people are still trying to dig through the wreckage to find where all the stolen assets came from, and it's oddly given the game a life after its death. To this day, copies of the game are still stupid expensive, because unlike Too Human, which is aggressively boring to talk about and to think about, Limo of the Lost is at least comically incompetent. Never before has anyone done so little with so little. It's disgusting, it's grotty, it's sleazy and uncomfortable, but it's trying just so hard that you can almost admire it. Almost. Uh, I haven't gotten Stockholm Syndrome yet. Before we move on to the more digital side of video game book burning, we gotta stop off in Dootopia. Babes, if you're watching this, and statistically, it's entirely likely that two X chromosomes will never grace this video, but if you are, get out, because this one's only for the bros. The guy game is what every man wants. Naked ladies at spring break, really bad pub trivia, and that's it, those are the only two things men want. The people who brought us this game are actually a little hard to pin down. Not the publishers, that was the gathering of developers. Wait. A, a band or a gathering. I fing knew it! I'm talking about Top Heavy Studios. <sighs> a studio developed by Jeff Spangenberg, because if a game like this was gonna be made, you knew it had to be a Spangenberg joint. The disgraced ex head of Retro Studios, uh, you know, the people behind the number four, Jeff was ousted from power for having just a gratuitous amount of pornography on his work computer. One clubbing from Mario later, and Jeff had a lot of money and not a lot of commitments. 
that's when he had the great idea that instead of hogging all the porn for himself, he could share the well with everybody! Give everyone porn! Like some sort of Amsterdam-based Santa Claus! That's when the team packed up and got on the fast trek to the South Padre Islands off the coast of Texas for spring break! There, they'd collect footage of girls answering trivia questions for an FMB game where if you got the question right and they got it wrong, they'd have to strip down! Because I know that if some sweaty 15-year-old just wanted to crank into some random girl boobs, they'd really want to answer a question about which playing card suit has a mustache first! Gotta be the first thing on their minds! This wasn't a game for the stupid babies that played Mario and Yoshi. This was for some creepy motherfuckers. And I made sure to get my copy before those loser stuffed shirts got the game taken off the shelves. Now, I have the game all to myself, and if you'll excuse me, I heard this game has cheese pizza in it, and I gotta see that! <sighs> that wasn't pizza. So, it turns out that getting drunken teenage girls to make up the majority of your game is a bad idea, cause whoops, one of them lied about their age, said she was 18, she was 17. In America, she was a minor when her boobs were whipped out. A minor had their bare breasts exposed on video, and then it was sold. It's child porn. The guy game is child porn. The team took Top Heavy and the Gathering of Developers to court for this because you know, and got the guy game taken off shelves. It's banned in America. The company went under after this came to light because, you know, Jeff Spangenberg vanished off the face of the earth. Both hide and hair of him ceased to exist, for aforementioned reasons. I don't know about you guys, but I feel like moving on. For this next one, I'll need to do a little bit of explaining. You see, in 1977, Nolan Bushnell, the same man who founded Atari, founded a small pizza location. That's right, the guy who helped fill that landfill once was looking to sling hot za to your child's squawk hole. Opening its first location in California in the same year, Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater was an instant success, seeing as Nolan's knowledge of video game from his time at Atari helped him manage the restaurant's unique setup. Not only did it serve pizza, but the place was also an arcade filled with games. Not like modern Chuck E. Cheese's where they'll have stuff like SpongeBob's Bubble Catch, or that game where you had to catch bees in a net and then put them in a honey pot. Was that a real arcade game or was that just a mirage that showed up in high humidity? The real selling point though were the animatronics. These things were entertainment that didn't need pay, break, or refreshments. Just set them up and watch them go. Soon after selling Atari to Warner Brothers, he devoted himself fully to the entertaining rat, and soon people were literally throwing themselves at him for the opportunity to franchise the restaurant. One of these franchisees tried to get cute and break the deal, which ended up going to court, with the franchisee, Robert Brock, creating Showbiz Pizza Place, a ripoff so obvious that the court ordered him to pay a small portion of his profits to Nolan. But what's interesting is that in parallel to the explosion of Chuck E. Cheese was the video game market crash, caused by Atari. Video games were out of vogue, and that's pretty much all Chuck had. So eventually, and for the first time, Chuck E. Cheese filed for bankruptcy, but were swiftly bought up. But by who? Showbiz Pizza Place, you monsters! That's right, the company that made Super Gianna Sisters now owned Nintendo, and in a purely bastard move, converted the showbiz locations to Chuck E. Cheese locations. They gutted their competition and were wearing them as a skin suit. And until the recent bankruptcy and controversy with Chuck saying, Poggers! <laughs> That's where the story ended. And some guy made a scary video game about it or something, I don't know, man. Five Nights at Freddy's World is the very forceful, dark sheep of the Five Nights at Freddy's series. I mean, most of the games are point-and-click horror games, and this is a turn-based RPG. I don't think you could get away with something like this unless you were just the biggest franchise online at the time, and oh, would you look at that, FNAF was. Of course, the game's announcement was met with, okay, I'll see you next April Fool, dum-dum. But that all changed when we found out, no, this is really what the game is gonna be, and people were mixed. FNAF is entirely tied to its own lore, and this seemed to have nothing to do with it and was more of a spin-off. So this was taking time away from getting to the next part of the story, and it caused some rumblings. But from the trailer, the game looked great! High quality 3D overworlds, a frantic battle system, and dozens of animatronics in an adorable new style! I can't wait for it! Sure smells like Bushnell in here. So what in the trailer seemed to be a fully realized overworld was now swapped out for a cheap Atari-inspired overworld, which, while it is a callback to the series Atari-style minigames, did little to impress. What's more, the game itself was glitchy, unpolished, and generally reeked of cut corners. And it turns out, yeah, this wasn't really given the time that it needed. FNAF had earned a reputation of its release dates more just being random dates that Scott Cawthon thought up out of nowhere, and the games would often come out a good few months before they were expected to. 
FNAF world, it just so happened this time it didn't work. However, you may know that this game is still fully playable. That's when I get to play fast and loose with the rules. This is a video about games you can't buy anymore. And you can't buy FNAF World, it was taken down off Steam. And in its place, an improved version of the game was uploaded to Game Jolt for absolutely free. And on top of that, the game would go on to get even more updates that included new characters, story scenarios, mini games, and a teaser for the next game, Sister Location. But this is pretty much the only example of a game who came out better after being delisted, and I'm happy to see that Scott Cawthon, the developer, had the integrity to rectify a mistake. <laughs> Before we get on to the last major one, I want to run down a few games that you can't buy, all for the same reason! LICENSING ISSUES! Oh god, yes, stick it right in my veins! I love those rights disagreements! Manage that metal! God, yes! When it comes to examples like this, oftentimes the source comes down to the issue of developers losing the rights to make games based on that property. And you can't really keep selling a game to make a profit on something you're not allowed to use. One group you'd guess would have zero trouble holding on to a license would be LEGO. They've got an iron grip on basically all of pop culture. Sure, Megablocks might have stolen SpongeBob out from under them, but if we start counting Megablocks for anything, then we're really going to be scraping the bottom of the bargain bin. However, two licensed games of theirs actually slipped through the cracks. Or rather, one did. LEGO Lord of the Rings and LEGO The Hobbit were delisted listed in 2019, and as far as I could find, there isn't really a good explanation. Tolkien fans have theorized that it's due to the use of voice lines from the movies causing complications, but even still, the fact that LEGO and Warner Brothers wouldn't fight harder to keep one of the most influential fantasy series of all time in their grip while still publishing other Middle Earth games is enough to take note of. Activision knows a thing or two about losing a license, having lost the license to both their Transformers games and their Legend of Korra game. For The Legend of Korra, the game was actually lore important, as it was set between the second and third seasons, and was created by Platinum Games! Now, this was in the era of Platinum Games, where they kept creating really quality character action games that proceeded to not sell well. It, we call this the pre tubi era. <laughs> but thankfully, Korra fans were plenty well acquainted with getting the shaft as their last season was relegated to Nick.com! Now you see, this is what happens when you kiss other girls. I hope you learn from this. The Transformers games were a bit of a bigger blow, though. War for Cybertron and Fall of Cybertron were a pair of games that told an epic sweeping story about the titular the War for Cybertron, establishing a whole new canon separate from any ongoing cartoons, comics, or movies. Not just that, but we also lost Transformers Devastation, which is another Platinum and Activision collab. A solid beat-em-up with the best theme for a character ever. However, Activision's oddest rights debacle is with Deadpool, a game released at the height of Deadpool's popularity, with his movie on the way and his lol epic random shirts defiling the god-given bodies of teenagers this nation over. So a game made sense. Now the less said about how it actually came out, the better, but one thing's certain, it's dead! Along with other Activision Marvel games like Spider-Man Shattered Dimension and X-Men Destinies by Silicon- Fuck off, Silicon Knights! Deadpool was removed from digital shelves. That was until the movie I was talking about was getting closer to release. Suddenly, not only was Deadpool back on Steam, it was getting a remaster for current-gen consoles. Just like Deadpool, it seemed the game wasn't dead after all. That was until they proceeded to lose the license again in 2017, making the newer versions unavailable. I genuinely can't think of any game that was killed like this, made its triumphant return two years later, and then died again. For the final game, where better to go than a place where nothing but abject misery and suffering, for all the sinners trapped there, is but assured. Konami. Ho oh, ho, I wish I could quit you, but you keep making Metaphys cards, so I'll keep backing you, you smelly pricks. Konami has done an exceptional job kicking all of the goodwill they've ever had to death. From being the company with franchises like Contra, Castlevania, and Metal Gear under its umbrella, years of bungling and dropping the ball have left Konami in a position where they can basically do no right. They let Castlevania sit dormant for years despite a hotter-than-the-sun anime on Netflix, let Contra Rogue Corps come out, which I... I just can't forgive them for, to the entire saga starting from Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes, to survive, Konami has done little to endear itself. Mr. Kojima had every intention of uh, being with us tonight. Uh... But unfortunately, he was uh, informed by a lawyer representing Konami uh, just recently that uh, he would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony to uh, accept um, any awards. You sons of bitches turned my favorite game into a pachinko machine! Turn it back! But they had a chance to turn their fortunes around. In August of 2014, a strange game came onto the PlayStation Store. A demo for what though it wasn't clear. 
was clear was that P.T. was the hottest game on Earth for a short while. The dread of living a loop over and over, trying desperately to solve an ever-expanding puzzle with the threat of a fate worse than death for those who failed it. Not only was the game intense and bone-chilling, the graphics were unbelievable. You could easily pass this touched-up photo of the game's creature Lisa as a real ghost photo, and it'd be ten times more convincing than those cowards who say ghosts are just floating little ball fellas! But then, when the puzzle I mentioned earlier was finally cracked, the big reveal was finally made. Metal Gear series director and professional weirdo Hideo Kojima, Oscar award-winning director Guillermo del Toro, and Walking Dead star Norman Reedus! The game? Silent Hills. Sadly, this stain just won't come out! Due to mounting tensions between Konami and Kojima over Konami being built on top of a portal to hell, Kojima split and not soon after, all development on Silent Hills died. This was a ship that didn't even make it out of harbor before sinking! But that's not all. People who had downloaded the demo but deleted it to make room for a one-tenth of a Call of Duty game would be barred from re-downloading the game, and were forced to, if they wanted to replay the demo, buy a new PS4 off eBay that already had it. Now that sounds like lunacy. After this massive dust storm, people decided that if they couldn't have PT, they would just make PT. Fan remakes of the game began popping up, with some coming dangerously close to recreating the game to a T. A PT! F of course, joking for a bit. That was until Konami put stop to all plans like that. They went so far as to give a dedicated creator a job at the company just to get them to stop making a new PT. This was a game that Konami had no interest whatsoever in letting you play, and wanted so badly to sweep it under the rug, despite how even recently people are still finding new things, like how Lisa is always behind you no matter where you are. In the most Konami move ever, they took something that was exciting and intrigued people and just stomped it to death. What's so disappointing about this sort of thing is how much interesting media can just be lost when companies decide to do something like this. For a game like Too Human or Limbo of the Lost, there are at least still discs that exist to keep playing the game. For something like PT or the Activision download-only games, they're just gone. If you got them, you have them. If you don't, better find someone who does. For a medium who's ever more concerned with preservation, these sort of things sting a lot more. The only positive is the backup ways of preserving games are becoming more and more readily available. The entire WiiWare catalog was backed up before it was shut down, emulation is making older out-of-print games more accessible, and companies like Limited Run are updating old games to keep them in the hands of the people in as close to their original form as possible. It's sad that games like this have to be lost forever for whatever reason, but it shows the dedication of this community to not let history die. But I will say that maybe just letting the guy game die won't kill us. I mean, I mean, the less child porn, the better. That's what I say. Mm -hmm.